Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a renowned composer, conductor, musical director, and producer who became a household name in the late 90s when he appeared on The Rosie O'Donnell Show as Rosie's musical director and lovable sidekick for six seasons, for which he received five Daytime Emmy Award nominations for Outstanding Achievement in Music Direction and Composition, and winning two Emmys for Best Talk Show. He's been the musical director for many Broadway shows, including Grease, Chicago, for which he won the Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle Award for Best Musical Direction, Brooklyn the Musical, which he also produced, Taboo starring Boy George, and Annie Get Your Gun starring Bernadette Peters and subsequently Reba McIntyre, which won the 1999 Tony Award for Best Revival of a Musical and for which he won a Grammy Award as producer for Best Musical Show Album. He also conducted the 1993 reunion of the original Broadway cast of Company in concert at Lincoln Center, as well as the U.S. tour of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Starlight Express. He was the arranger and musical director for Patti LuPone's live concert on Broadway, and he also produced the album. He's been the musical director and orchestrator for numerous TV specials, including, most recently, the fabulous Carol Burnett 90th birthday special on NBC, which was the most watched television show of the week. He's recorded four solo albums, including my personal favorite, John McDaniel Live at Joe's Pub. He also produced and conducted a wonderful CD entitled The Maury Yeston Songbook, featuring performances by Tony Award winners Betty Buckley, Sutton Foster, Christine Ebersole, and many others. And his collaborations with renowned British singer Barb Younger have produced two popular albums, Come Together, featuring songs from the Beatles, and Float Like a Butterfly, celebrating the songs of Sting. In 2000, he received the Board of Directors Award from the Manhattan Association of Cabarets. He's been a special guest conductor for numerous symphony orchestras throughout the country, and he frequently performs in concert all across America and around the world, working with artists like Audra McDonald, Jesse Mueller, Brian Stokes Mitchell, Christine Ebersole, and many more. And currently, the immensely successful production of Bonnie and Clyde in London's West End features orchestrations by our guest. I'm delighted to welcome the incomparable John McDaniel to our show. John, thank, you. thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Harvey, and thank you, everybody. Good night. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have to talk about? You did such great, such a great job. Can I can I correct you on one thing? Because you're so brilliant, and you'll understand this. Sure. I, I was the arranger and music director for Patti LuPone's live album, but I did not produce that one. That was the great Billy Rosenfield. So I just want to, you know, you know, being a lawyer, you know, you got to get it right. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for correcting me. I, I want to start by congratulating you on the enormous success of Bonnie and Clyde. You must be thrilled. Thank you. It's a little bit of a surprise. I am thrilled. We did the show on Broadway about 10 years ago, and it ran for only four months. Someone put it really well. The producers built this beautiful ship, and we opened on December 4th, as I recall. And you know, January is notoriously difficult because everybody spent all their money on Christmas presents and no one's going to Broadway. So they built this beautiful ship in December and set it out to sea with no fuel to get through the winter. So we we closed a few months later, and but we were so proud of the show, and people really responded to it like regular folks, you know, not so much the critics. And then all these years later, to have someone pick it up and do it in the West End, it was a thrill, and it was great. I got to see it last month when I was over there, and it was a beautiful, beautiful, really raw, wonderful production. I loved it. And it was do great to hear my orchestrations like in the air in London. It was crazy. Do you know if or when we will get to see the show on Broadway? I don't know. I've secretly wondered if they might bring it over. They're going to tour it in the UK next year. So it's going to play all around the UK and Ireland. So it'll it'll have more life. But it it might it might be a good idea. This production was great. So who knows? Let's hope so. You know, when I was doing my research for this interview, John, I read that when you were in grade six, you were in a school production of The Music Man. And from that day on, you were hooked on Broadway musicals. Is that right? That is totally true. I, I played J.C. Squires, the tenor in the quartet, the barbershop quartet, and I was hooked. I just thought, what is this wonderful art form? And the music of that show is spectacular. And I, it just seeped into my DNA and it's a part of me. I can, 
I can say I can do you got trouble. I can do the Rock Island opening. It's still really a, a, a real meaningful part of me. I want to take you back to the very first show you saw at the St. Louis Muni, Mac and Mabel. What was it about that experience that made you fall in love with musical theater? Well, I had I had begun to go to the Muni around that was around that was 1974. So I was 13. And uh, I remember seeing Mac and Mabel vividly. My Uncle George had some great box seats, these beautiful seats. And so I went with my family and I was just astounded. I knew because, of course, Robert Preston had been in The Music Man. So his voice and his entire vibe was so familiar to me. And I love seeing him live and in person. But who was this diminutive little creature, this beautiful little actress playing Mabel? I didn't know of Bernadette Peters at that time, but her name, you know, now is all these years later, I got to work with her on Broadway, which was a thrill to be sure. <laughs> Your mom who taught you to play the piano was strictly into classical music, but when she <laughs> saw that you were gravitating to pop music and show tunes, she sent you to another piano teacher, Elaine Boyd, who had right. more, she had more expertise in those areas. That was incredibly wise and very generous of your mom, don't you think? I do think so. Mom could see that I was not really taking to Mozart and Bach and Beethoven like some of her other students were. But Elaine Boyd really allowed me to like do some ragtime and some more contemporary music. And it was Gershwin and stuff like that. It was really, it was a great move on, on my mom's part. Once you started to pursue a career in music and specifically musical theater, who were your musical theater role models? The biggest one that comes to mind is a woman who we just lost last year, Nancy Harvey. She had an after school children's theater group called Art for Children's Theater. And kids came from all over St. Louis to her home in Webster and we rehearsed musicals. We did one each semester. And that was where I first did The Music Man, actually. So she loved musicals. She herself had played Dorothy at the St. Louis Muni Opera many years before that. So it's all sort of intertwined, isn't it? But she turned me on to Damn Yankees and Plain and Fancy and and West Side Story and some incredible shows that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten to know. John, like everyone else, I first fell in love with you on the Rosie O'Donnell show. Over those six years, you worked with everyone from Tony Bennett, Neil Diamond, Dolly Parton, to Bette Midler, Liza, Barry it's Manilow, crazy. Madonna. It's and that's just scratching the surface. Do you have any, any moments in your memory from that show that really stand out for you? I think I think it was working with Barry Manilow and Billy Joel and those guys that really, because I had grown up listening to them in the car when I was learning how to drive. And so they, their music was a part of my zeitgeist and everyone's zeitgeist, the zeitgeist. So to get a chance to, you know, Billy Joel would leave me messages on my home machine. This was before we had, you know, the internet and stuff. It was, you'd leave messages. So I saved those. And getting to work with with Manilow was also thrilling. And you mentioned Tony Bennett. That's one that really also is very near and dear because he was a last minute replacement on a Christmas episode. Someone had to bow out. They were ill or whatever. So we booked Tony Bennett and there wasn't time to get Ralph Sharon, his pianist who lived in L.A., to New York for the taping. And Tony said, that's okay, I'll work with John. And I almost fell out of my chair. First of all, he knows my name. Second of all, like he said, okay. And we did we did White Christmas and with my band. And it was one of those moments, pinch me moments. Did you ever get starstruck when you saw some of the big stars appearing on the show? I would say no. Weirdly, it became sort of normal. And I had been around stars for years doing musicals and and television stuff. And so, I mean, you, it's exciting to meet those people, but I don't think I ever was actually. I mean, what is what is starstruck anyway? Does that mean like, uh, 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 like I can't talk? <laughs> I don't know. No, I didn't. No, not really. It, it's been a sort of a normal in my life, weirdly. For me, being starstruck is kind of when you have to pinch yourself, like you can't believe that this person you've idolized is suddenly in front of you in the flesh. I know. Well, we did. We had those, you know, Julie Andrews moments, and I got to work with Madeline Kahn, who was so brilliant. 
I remember vividly, I was on, I was doing a concert in Baltimore and I remember talking to Madeline on the phone from my hotel in Baltimore about what we were going to do the next morning. So, you know, there's so many flashes of incredible folks I got to, to play with, you know, in the sandbox. Yeah, the music on that show was so important. I remember when Helen Reddy was on the show, Rosie and Helen did I Am Woman. And of course, <laughs> you played it. Yes. There are so many moments like that. It, that it, was, um, it was every day. Harvey, it was every day. It was crazy. What was it like for you adjusting to suddenly being so recognizable and famous because of the TV show? You know, Rosie just asked me that question the other day. It's funny. And it's a great question because it actually, it was tangible. So we, June 10th, 1996, we went on the air on a Monday. And I remember on Tuesday, walking down the street and having people go, is that the guy from Rosie? Is that? And and it it changed my recognizability factor overnight, literally the next day. And I thought, oh, wow, here we go. And it was a wild ride. You know, it was it was crazy. I had a stalker. It was nuts. But you had a stalker. All, I did. But that's all calmed down now. <laughs> well, one thing I really loved about the Rosie show was that she celebrated Broadway and she introduced the public to a lot of Broadway stars like Kristen Chenoweth, Christine Ebersole, Linda Etter, yeah. who most people had never, ever heard of. That was really wonderful, wasn't it? It was great. And actually, it was sort of an unspoken rule that if you had a show on Broadway, a musical, you were guaranteed a spot on our show, even if it was the tiniest little show that no one had ever heard of or might ever hear of, you could come on and do a number. And we made sure that that was the case because it, and it was thrilling to have that vehicle to be able to do that. You know, you and Rosie made everything look so easy and fun, but was doing the show hard work. And by that, I mean, was it harder than being music director for a Broadway show? Well, it was different because every day was different. So we would, the show was live from 10 to 11. And so you, you do all the preparation sort of the day before or a couple of days before. I remember Manila liked to rehearse. So we would, we would be talking two weeks in advance, like, how are we going to get this right? And I just love that about him. So we would prep, we would make a date to go to a rehearsal studio with the band like the day before. So we were setting it up, but basically everything happened the morning of the show. What what games we were going to play? Was I going to host a game? That just all came like the day of the show, and uh, we it you know it was actually fun. It was actually fun. The stakes were high because millions of people were going to see whatever we were going to try to do, but that was thrilling too. It was fun. It was it. We were at the top of our game. You know, it just everyone was firing on all cylinders and that was thrilling. And so therefore exhausting because that adrenaline and that that drive to get it right was real and intense. So the weekends were, you know, <laughs> recharge the battery, come back on Monday and do it all over again. Are you surprised at how well you adjusted to that pace, to that format, to being famous? Because you made it look very, very easy. I was in my 30s, you know what I mean? I had the energy of a kid and it was, it, while it was challenging, it was never boring and it was never not fun. It was always thrilling. Oh my gosh, here comes Martha Stewart. Oh my gosh, here comes, you know, I mean, it was- Everybody. It was, it was remarkable, yeah. When the show ended after six seasons, even though it was still enormously popular, were yeah. you sad to see the show end? I was, to be honest, I really was. It had been the most wonderful wild ride. And, but, but, you know, Rosie had said from the beginning, seven years, it wound up being six and a half, which was actually perfect. We wound up pre-taping everything for that last summer. So we had, again, we had the summer off, but it was sad to say goodbye to my friends, the cameramen, the you know, the entire crew was fantastic. My band, my band and I are still really close. And we actually got together about six or seven years ago, which is, you know, 20, 20 years after the fact. And we're still very close. But I loved hanging with them every day. Uh, it was it was joyous. Well, it was sure joyous for the audience. I can tell you, I never hey. missed an episode. I had my I, I had my VCR set to record it. Yes. Now, yes. you know, John, as you well know, Rosie did not come out publicly until very close to the end of her show. And as far as I can recall, correct me if I'm wrong, 
you didn't explicitly come out publicly while the show was on the air, although you occasionally mentioned your partner, Glenn. Were you under any pressure to not come out while you were on the show? We were early on. We were told by the suits at Warner Brothers and Telepictures that we were not to talk about our sexuality, like leave that at home. And this is a fun daytime place. You know, we're not going to get into anything too political. (laughs) And so we were actually and this was before Will and Grace. It was before Ellen came out. You know, it was 1996, 97. It was a very different time. Very different. And I, I have always been out in my real life. I'm very comfortable with who I am. And my boyfriends and my partners and my life is very open. And I didn't really ever hide anything on the show. We just never really got into anything about it until she finally was like, this is ridiculous. And, you know, she had told the producers before we ever went on the air, she says, yeah, you know, I'm gay. And and they were like, yes, we know. But then when it, when push came to shove and it came time to put it out in the world and they saw how popular it was, they didn't want to get into any kind of controversy, lose uh, advertisers and all that, you know, stuff that comes with a huge TV show. So it was it was tricky. We were navigating strange waters. Yeah, I think that your gay audience could feel it and sympathized with what you were going through. But at the same time, we all needed validation and we couldn't wait for something to be said eventually. I, I wonder, <clears throat> would you ever again want to be a, the musical director for another TV show? Well, I mean, I love, you know, doing the Carol Burnett birthday special was uh, a real treat, but that was, of course, a one off. But uh, yes, I would. In fact, I have a secret, you know, secret thought that someday Rosie and I'll come back and do some kind of a maybe a reunion special or something. And even a series it through the years when Rosie was doing remember when she did the Oprah thing in in Chicago. But you weren't there. No, 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 I wasn't there. They couldn't get any guests because it was Chicago and there were like three people to have on, I guess. I don't know. So she was going to move it to New York and and she called me and said, if I did, would you be interested? I was like, yes, I would. I would love to because Rosie is, she's one of those, she's what you see is what you get. She's so honest and real and loyal and fantastic. So, you know, I'm not, I certainly would not say no. I loved doing it. And it would be different now. We're different people, you know. I think it would be a fabulous idea. The only thing is that Rosie isn't funny anymore. She's become serious. Mm. She feels the need to speak uh, as she did on The View. And I personally love it because our politics align very closely. I just don't know how the format would work that it doesn't get too heavy, too intense. And one of the great things about you, John, is that you were very light. You're, you kept things deliberately cheerful and you never spoke about any opinions, about any social issues or political issues. And I think that was very wise because you were a good balance for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, I'm generally an optimistic person and, you know, find the good in people and I, I never felt like I wasn't being myself. You know, I just, uh, I do think, I think funny, if we did it today, because we're different people, I feel like it would, she's still funny, by the way, we were in touch and stuff. And she's, her her sense of humor and her love for Tom Cruise has not diminished one bit. <laughs> and so, you know, I think, I think there's something there. I don't know. Oh, I, I pray that you come back. I think that would be wonderful. <laughs> You saw Patti Lapone star in The Baker's Wife when you were a kid in St. Louis, and then you got to produce her concert and you worked on the album, which yeah. includes Meadowlark. That must have been surreal for you. Yeah, so this is a great... The first time I met Patti was on the Fair Sea cruise ship in the 80s, mid-80s in the Caribbean. She was, She and Cab Calloway were the two... The first... I was... Okay. First cruise as a band leader on a cruise ship. Right. And it was uh, January 80, something like 85. And they were doing celebrities uh, on the cruises. And so my first cruise, we had Patti Lapone and Cab Calloway, which was absolutely music theater heaven, you know, for me. Well, music heaven. And so Patti said, oh, I've got this song. It's really long. It's really hard. It's I don't know if we're going to do it, but here it is. And, and uh, I said, is it an E? Because I knew Meadowlark was an E, the key of E. 
And she said, yes. And so I said, I don't need the music. So we did it because I knew I knew the song. And so we were fast friends ever since then. Wow. You worked with Mark Shaman on the Broadway show, Catch Me If You Can, which I yes. got to see in 2011. The show only ran for six months. Were you surprised that it didn't run longer? We were. I, we had one one of our lead producers, rest her soul. I think the feeling is that she just didn't believe in the show and she was afraid to go through September and October. So we they, they pulled the plug and I, we were, I mean, Norbert had won the Tony and business was good. I think they were looking ahead and seeing that September, everybody drops off in September, but she just, I don't think she believed it was going to run. So she pulled the plug. We were all shocked actually. Yeah. That was a mistake. I think so. But you know, Another Broadway show you worked on was Taboo, starring Boy George, which Rosie produced. Yes. The show did really, really well in London, but wasn't that well received in New York. Mm -hmm. Did you ever figure out why? You know, I think the show needed, well, we we took it apart and put it back together again, but we were doing all of our work on 45th Street. We didn't take it out of town. We didn't give it maybe the, the TLC that it needed to get really good. And it was high. It was high stakes, high drama. Trying to get it right, right during previews on Broadway. It was it was a tough time, but and the show is kind of magnificent in a lot of ways, and a lot of people really responded to it, but just not enough to put the butts in the seats every night. I guess that's a real shame. When I looked at your Wikipedia page, there's a reference to you writing a musical adaptation of "It's a Wonderful Life." Did you ever end up doing that? We did. Uh, Kathy Lee and I wrote this. Very, I think it's really nice. Uh, it's a kind of a long story, but it wound up having to do with we weren't ultimately able to get the rights to do our production, which was a little bit of a heartache. But, you know, it's the way of the lawyers, Harvey. <laughs> you know, well, no, 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 I'm not. You know, it's it's you got to get it right. You've got to make sure you have all your ducks in a row. And while the artistic side of it was really terrific, we didn't really have good luck in in securing the rights to the book upon which the film is made. Long story. Anyway, I wish that, you had called me because I was a judge. Maybe I could have had a few connections. Exactly. Oh, if I'd only had your number then. I also read that you were working on a show about Nat King Cole. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that one's very much alive. Our lead producer's in London and she is periodically so so we have a really busy creative team coleman domingo wrote the book with patricia mcgregor so coleman is you know an actor very successful actor on fear of the walking dead and many other shows and movies he's in the color purple new musical remake that opens on christmas day dule hill plays nat dule is on i think two television series now Patricia McGregor, who I mentioned, is the new artistic director of New York Theatre Workshop in New York. So she's wildly busy. I'm all over the shop. So we're trying to find a time when we can all have a window to do this beautiful show about Nat King Cole. And I'm optimistic, actually. I just saw Susan, our producer in London, and she's excited. And so I, I feel like we're going to be getting the band back together. We were supposed to do something April of 2020, and we all know how that wound up. So yeah. we're just postponed, but we'll we'll be back. Oh, I sure hope so, because that music and his voice oh are timeless. <laughs> timeless. And, yes, and Dulé is magnificent in the part. So fingers now, crossed. Now, John, of all the albums you've produced, I've got to tell you that the Maury Yeston songbook is my all-time favorite. You've got people like Brent Barrett and Liz Calloway and Betty Buckley singing these amazing songs. That project must have been a real labor of love. It was, certainly. It's exactly that. Tommy Kresker, the wonderful CEO of PS Classics, the the uh, record label, called me and said, because I, I, he said, I've got this Maury Yeston project, and I'd love to see if this might be a good fit for us. So he and I produced it together, and I did arrangements and conducted it. We had some other arrangers as well, but it was a combination of just a lot of things were solo piano, and some things were full orchestra. And we we chose, you know, we said who who can we call? Oh, let's get Sutton Foster. Let's get you know, and it was it was fun to put together, and I'm thrilled with. It still does really well. I get checks in the mail four times a year. It's nice. Well, you're going to get a few more because I'm telling all my viewers oh. 
if they, if you don't have this mm-hmm. album, you've got to get it because it is like going to a show and hearing the most beautiful voices, the most beautiful orchestrations. It's a gorgeously produced album. The c- album cover is on the screen behind me. So yes, please, everyone, please get this album. Thanks. Now, Robbie. you've made two terrific albums with Barb Younger, and they're they're also magical. What makes her so special to work with? Oh, my gosh. I can't even put my finger on it. She's so unique. I remember first uh, going to see her at the Metropolitan Room in New York. Friends had said, you've got to see this. She's I can't even describe her to you. Just go. And so I was like, all right. So I went and I. I we sat there looking and I said, who is this creature? She was prowling about the stage and opening up this giant, beautiful voice. And she was just she just grabbed my heart that first night. So she was selling CDs in the lobby uh, on the way out. And I walked up to her and I bought one of each. And I said, now I have to know you. We have to be friends and we have to work together. And she said, security, (laughs) because she was actually a little scared of me. But I had the whole thing in my mind. I was like, had this sort of vision and it proved to be just right. So I brought her to the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center where I'm the artistic director of the cabaret and performance conference that happens every August. And I invited her. She was my first artist that I presented in 19, no, 19, 2013. And she was so tremendous. The next morning she was leaving and I burst into tears and I said, you've got to come back. So the next year I asked her to come back and be on the staff and be there for the entire 10 day conference, which happily she said, yes, we began to work together. And I said, let me do a little arrangement for you. Let's see how this is. And she just we we took to working together like ducks to water and it's been one of the joys of my life she's one of my dearest friends she was really really lucky the day that she met you boy, <laughs> boy. well both of us i think now i have to tell you i absolutely loved the carol burnett 90th birthday special how much fun was that Thank to you. work on did you get to spend some time with carol Oh, yes, absolutely. I was there because Carol asked for me, which is, you know, a thrill. We've been friends for 30 years. And she she's like Rosie, very loyal, very deliciously wonderful and a tremendous human being. So when she asked me, I I cleared my schedule. I just absolutely would have done any. I will still do anything for Carol. But it was so much fun. We worked. It was about a six month pre-production time and it was all about getting who's going to sing what how's it going to go it was a lot of you know moving things moving parts moving things around but i'm so thrilled with the final product it was honestly to get to work on a primetime variety special for network which those just don't happen anymore you know they it's a it's a it, it was an absolute thrill i'll never ever forget it well i hope that we're all here to see you be the musical director for Carol Burnett's 100th birthday special. Oh my God, I'm there, I'm there. You know, the show was so popular that NBC decided to air it twice. That never happens. I know, it was on Wednesday on her birthday and the numbers, you know, as you said in your very kind and gracious intro that we won the week in the ratings and NBC was like, let's put it on again on Sunday and they generated a whole new audience on Sunday night. So well, and it's streaming on Peacock still. So that's that's good. People can still watch it there. Yeah, it was beautiful from beginning to end. I'm not totally clear why Cher chose to wear that outfit. Because Do you know? It came from one of her concert tours. Yeah, so Bob Mackey told me after the show, he said, you wouldn't believe Cher called me. Gosh, I don't know. I hope Bob doesn't mind me telling the story. But apparently Cher had said, Oh, Bob, I've got to wear this one thing. You remember this thing I wore? La, la, la. He was like, yes, I got it. So they had it shipped out to Malibu to Cher's place. And then she showed up wearing something completely different. <laughs> so, you know, you never know what's, what <laughs> mood is going to strike, what the diva is going to do. Just so funny. But one of the things about you that I sense is that you're very easygoing. You're even tempered. I don't get the sense that you get easily <clears throat> flustered or angry. Am I right? I would say I don't get flustered. I mean, I certainly get angry if I need to, but but life is pretty good. And I think I have learned that it's not about trying to get somewhere in life. It's really about where are you now? Are you happy today? Do you wake up with a new opportunity to be happy and to spread joy out into the neighborhood? 
you know, it, it's just, it's kind of where I live and it makes me feel good to live happily every day, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And I can tell you that you radiate that kind of optimism, the gratitude. It really, really comes through. It every day it's, it's on real. TV. It comes through now the authenticity, the sincerity. There's this huge talent there, but you're very humble and you're very matter of fact about the work you do, which is actually pretty monumental. Uh, thanks. <laughs> I can't really approach it any other way. Now, John, you've worked with so many fabulous entertainers. I want to mention a few and ask you what comes to your mind when you hear their names. Let's, Ooh, start, okay. with, let's start with Shirley MacLaine. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, we did a one-nighter in uh, Palm Beach, Florida, one New Year's Eve. It was tremendous. She's She was really fun. I don't have a photo with her. I'm so mad. This was like back in the days before we all had these great cameras on our cell phones. So, But we had a wonderful time. And I remember spending time in her dressing room. We had a little time between the rehearsal and the show. And she lived up to every expectation. She was... She, she, I mean, she was focused because she had not been on stage in a while. <clears throat> and I think this is one of her last times she ever was on stage. And the curtain went up and she was in that sweet charity Fosse pose. And it was and the crowd went nuts. It was it was crazy. It was so much fun. How about George Burns? No. Oh. Again, uh, he was very gentle, very he was such a pro. He'd been doing it for, you know, decades. I mean, 100 years almost. And he was great. He and I also had a little chat after the rehearsal before we left the show lounge. This was, he was one of the celebrities on these cruises that I was telling you about with Cab Calloway and Patti LuPone. And he, he was a great hit with the audience and he was, he just really knew what he was doing. And he was like, this is, this is me. It was, it was great to get a chance to work with him. What about working with Dick Van Dyke? So that was on the Rosie. We took the Rosie Dental show to Hollywood a couple of times and to came on and sang uh, on the show. And we were on the Warner Brothers lot and each of us had, we had trailers, just trailers with the, for the guest artists. And I had my own trailer and, and I had a little keyboard in my trailer. So I remember he came into my trailer and we went over what he was going to sing. And I just like, this is crazy. This is crazy. This is crazy. But it was great, great fun. He was True gentleman. I'm so happy you're asking me about the people who were nice. Well, <laughs> no. I'm asking you about my favorites. <laughs> okay, good. You got to work with Elaine Stritch. There are so many stories about her. What was she like? Well, she was amazing when I uh, I did, you know, she was in the original cast of Company. So we had that experience both in Los Angeles and then subsequently at Lincoln Center with the original cast of Company. But also the very first musical that I stood up conducting for and was music director of was a production of Pal Joey in Los Angeles. <clears throat> what year was that, John? Gosh, 90, 1990. Dixie Carter was the star and Elaine Stritch was reprising her role of Melba that she had done on Broadway in 1952, I think. Singing Zip. And, she, and the very last performance we had done a great run and she was doing her walk off the sort of stripper feel da, do, do, da, do, do, da. and she's shimmying off stage and she said she looked at me right in the pit and said take me home john and i thought oh my god i can die now this is crazy <laughs> but we were we did become very friendly and she i because i had a car and she didn't drive and, and she was living at the Bel Air Hotel for a while in LA, she would call me and say, ah, I've got this party, this dinner party to go to. You want to go with me? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't really about go with me. It was like, do you want to, you know, do you want to drive me and be my plus one? Hell yes, I do. So we, so I would swing by and pick her up and up into the Hollywood Hills, we would drive to some really fun dinner parties and events. And she was one of a kind. I adored her. Adored yeah, her. I, I mean, just... she could, she could be, she could be bristly, but we always connected musically really well. I just loved her. <clears throat> what was Bette Midler like to work with? Oh, thrilling because when I was driving my, my mom's car and when I was in high school, Bette, Bette Midler Live, the, her live concert, uh, would, was on my cassette player and I knew every word and I was a huge fan. 
And just to get a moment to to work with her was was thrilling. Really, really good. And I did her Huluween benefit. She does this at every year at the Waldorf, raising money for the New York Parks and Recreation, the restoration project. And yeah, she's she's a very interesting person, but really fun to be in her house up on, you know, Central Park. What's it called? Fifth Avenue. She's remarkable, remarkable lady. You've worked with Billy Porter as well, haven't you? I've known Billy since the 80s. When I was doing Starlight Express on the road, we would have auditions for singers and skaters in every city. And Billy came, Billy was going to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and I had gone there. And so we're at the Benetton in Pittsburgh, and the very handful of singers came in. But I remembered him so specifically. And I think I even took his number and had my, his number in my book. And then a few years later, we did Grease, the, the rosy Tommy Toon Grease on Broadway. And we asked Billy to be the teen angel. And he was spectacular. Still is. My gosh, he's touring the country now in this giant Billy Porter show. It's thrilling. Yeah, he really is <laughs> just a, a ray of sunshine in every way. And of course, I have to mention Kristen Chenoweth. I know you've worked with her. Yes, indeed. Indeed. I've Happy to say I've been the camp director of, of Kristen Chenoweth's Broadway boot camp in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a couple of times. And love, I love working with students and inspiring the next generation and all of that. And she does this wonderful thing every summer. It's, it's great. She's wonderful. It was great to have her on the Carol special. I hadn't seen her in a little bit since the pandemic, actually. So that was great. Is there any music star that you have not worked with yet that you would like to? Mick Jagger. Better hurry up. I know. Let's go. Let's go. You know, no, I, I mean, thought I... you were going to say Barbara Streisand or Cher. I know they were both ah. on the Rosie show, but did you get to work with them musically? No, they didn't sing. Neither one of them sang. Yeah. I thought I thought Cher might, but, but she hasn't. And of course, when I heard that she was going to be on the Carol Burnett birthday special, I said, oh, my God. What could she sing? Can't we get her to sing something? I was like, let's do it. But she she just did that intro. It was great that she came and was there. But sing next time, Cher. Come on. Yeah. You grew up attending shows at the Muni, which is a very <coughs> famous outdoor theater in St. Louis. Huge. And I understand that recently you got to hear your orchestrations at the St. Louis Muni. That must have been thrilling. It was. It was fun. I've I've orchestrated two projects that have played the Muni in recent years. And having grown up there as a little kid watching and now to be the one to write the orchestrations to be played, it's it it it, it it's not hmm, it's very meaningful and very fun. And it can't really describe it. It's unlike I mean, I've heard my stuff now in London and on Broadway, but to hear it in New York in that beautiful park is really meaningful. Wow. I want to ask you a question that I asked Jerry Mitchell. He was on the show a few weeks ago. Oh. I was lamenting the fact that many Broadway shows these days don't have original music. There's a lot of jukebox musicals using songs that are already big hits. What yeah. do you think of jukebox musicals? Hard to say overall because some are really good and some aren't for me, but Broadway sort of become like an amusement park where, you know, oh, come taste this flavor that you've had before or this film that you've seen before or, you know, and that doesn't really interest me. I mean, I know I did Catch Me If You Can. Really, that was to work with Jack O'Brien, the brilliant director, Jack O'Brien and Mark and Scott, who I've known forever. And um, you were going to do It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, absolutely. And Bonnie and Clyde is a repeat in a way. Yeah, it's a well, it's based on their writings. It's not wasn't based on the movie, but the show, the musical is really based on what we know about what actually happened to them. With but it's at by, least it's original music. It's original. Yeah. Music. Yeah. Don Black and Frank Wildhorn wrote some great songs for Bonnie and Clyde. And I'm, you know, I'm adapting Brave New World, which is a book by Aldous Huxley from 1937, which he wrote and was incredibly prescient. I mean, so much of what he imagined the future to be is happening right now. So I think, but jukebox, I guess, like a song catalog. I mean, there's there are good ones and bad ones. I'm I'm 
sensing that you enjoy original music and I'm with you. I like to go see a show that takes me away and doesn't make me think, oh, I remember when I first heard that song. Like, I want to be in the story. Right. I want to be really following these characters. Who am I rooting for? What's happening? How are they going to get out of this mess? I don't want to be thinking about when I first heard this song when I was in vacation in South Carolina or something like that. You know what I mean? Well, and the other thing is, when I hear the song on the stage in the Broadway show, I'm comparing it to the recording that mm-hmm. I remember that's that's entrenched in my memory. Yeah. And it takes me out of the show. Yeah, I think that's true, too. Now, so. one of the things I really admire about you, besides your incredible gift, is that in recent years, you've devoted a lot of your time to teaching young music artists at Fordham University and at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center and at right. Christian Chenoweth's Broadway Boot Camp. Tell me why teaching is such a passion for you. Well, first of all, it's two things for me. It's really difficult. It's It takes so much concentration when I work with students. I find my, after three hours, I'm just, I just need a hospital. <laughs> I'm so tired. Call me an ambulance. It's really because you're giving so much of your attention and your creative juice to say, how could I, what could I offer this student, this performer that might really help them, that they might cotton to, that might click something in them. That's not just a critical thing, but how can I allow them to be more fully themselves, uh, their beautiful selves? So it's it's tiring, but it's also so rewarding. When I when I work at Fordham, I teach a summer music theater course every summer. I'm going into my third year doing that. And to see what a student with five weeks. So on day one to day, you know, whatever at the end of five weeks, to watch their growth is is a stunning thing. And I uh, some of them follow me on Instagram and I see them on Instagram and I see them, you know, performing and doing shows and going on to to um, some of them great things. And it's exciting. It's really wonderful. Are you the kind of teacher you would have liked to have when you were studying at Carnegie Mellon? Yes, because I'm all about who are you? Like, what are you bringing to this that's special? I feel like the the acting at Carnegie Mellon was really intense. And you're, I was so young. All of us in my class were so young, babies, 18, 19 years old. We have, you know, when you haven't lived quite enough, and it's true for the Fordham students too, they're at this place where they haven't had tons of life experience. They've begun to, but some of them will choose to sing songs that are about a wizened old person sitting on the the you know the porch at the end of their lives and i say this is not a song for you you don't have this kind of experience you're sort of guessing at what this might be so and you know song selection is so important i've gotten off track of your question but i think the it's it's the fulfillment of seeing the growth is what really works for me if you can articulate what was the most important career advice you ever got Oh, gosh. Well, two things. Uh, When I was at Carnegie Mellon, after my sophomore year, the head of the department, Mel Shapiro, who I think is still teaching at UCLA now, pulled me into his office and he said, your your acting is good, your singing is good, your dancing is good, but your music is way up here. And he touched the ceiling. And he said, we want to create a program for you to keep you here at school. But but make it more music centric. So I studied orchestration and conducting and I got back to piano lessons and it turned out to be such great advice because it steered me into a little bit away from wanting to be down center on on a Broadway stage into being a music director. And I, I had never, I had done music direction since I was 12, but I hadn't really considered it as a career thing. So Mel turned me and said, look this way. And it was beautiful. It was fantastic. It turned out to be a great, great move. And the other career advice was from Rosie O'Donnell herself. The first day we were in the office before we were just starting production. We were in the office at 30 Rock and I had been hired and the deal was done. And here I'm going to be this music director of this television talk show. I knew how to put Broadway shows together, recordings, but a television. I was like, so I, I plopped myself down on Rosie's couch and I said, now, what do you want me to do? And she said, just do what you do. Just do what you do. Those words emblazoned on my soul. And she let me just run free. I wrote the theme song. 
wrote all the, uh, arranged all the bumper music and got to play stuff from Mary Poppins and Bye Bye Birdie and just do whatever I wanted to do. And it made for a really, I think, happy, fun experience for everybody. Yeah, I love the fact that you figured out what you're really good at and you focused on that and you followed your instincts and right. your gut about what the audience would like and you were right about that. Well, it just was the only way I could do it. And she gave me that full freedom uh, to, to go out and just do what I do. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about John McDaniel by his music and see his concert schedule by going to his official website, johnmcdaniel.com. Well, John, I have to tell you, I have loved every minute of having you on this show. You've Thank brought you, us, Harvey. You have brought us so much wonderful music. You've brought us great shows over the years. I look forward to every new project that you bring us, especially Brave New World Thank and you. the Nat King Cole Show. Yes, Please, please come back anytime you want. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. I appreciate it, Harvey. Thanks for having me. Our guest has been the fabulous musician, conductor, and producer, John McDaniel. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Lori Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.